Management Japan Center is very honored and very excited to be talking with Katsura Sunshine. And uh, Katsura-sama, thank you for, for making time to, uh, to allow me to interview you today. I know you're very busy. Not at all. And uh, if you want to know more about Katsura Sunshine, all you got to do, and I'll list, I'll list you, these websites are, you know, of course, your, your, your homepage, is, which is gorgeous. Uh, you also have a Wikipedia page. And uh, if you, anyone goes onto YouTube and puts in Katsura Sunshine, you're going to see wonderful, uh, you know, sections of your performances in Dakugo. And that comes to what we really, I really want to talk with you about is this, this, this art in Japan, uh, Dakugo, this comedic storytelling and I just wanted to leave it open to you. I mean, how did you, first of all, how did you, how did you come to Japan? And how were you introduced to Dakugo and how did you fall in love with it? You know, I was a playwright and a composer. I was writing musicals in Toronto in my 20s, out, out of university. And um, I had been concentrating on ancient Greek comedy, 2,500 years ago, Aristophanes. And I read an article a lot as part of my research. I read an article that said that ancient Greek comedy and tragedy and Japanese no and kabuki are very have all these like coincidental similarities. Now they're the the existences of these two art forms are like two thousand years apart, and there's no way there was any kind of communication between Greece and and Japan in that way. So. There was something that something very, maybe very basic to like human drama that like was being expressed in these things, but like the instruments they use are the same, and and the use of masks and the different levels of like iteration and stuff like that. So it was very really fascinating. So I thought, yeah, I gotta go to Japan and see some kabuki. And you know, this is twenty one years ago, so you couldn't just Google Japan or anything like that, right? So I just had like tidbits of information. My some of my friends had been to Japan. Everybody said it was incredible. People like loved it for different things. Um, some of them said just like the food's off the charts. Some people, my, one of my friends went to study graphic design and just like that kind of thing blew him away. Um, just that, everything I heard, but I had no particular image of Japan. I just, so I just went myself to see some kabuki. I thought I'd come back to Canada within a couple months. And like my third day here in Tokyo, I just said, I am never going back to Canada. This is just, it just blew me away. Just how uh, amazing Japan was. I just felt like it was literally love at first sight. And the thing I think that was the biggest impression on me, and you would probably uh, understand this as an American, but certainly as a Canadian, is that um, you had like centuries old culture and like super modern, almost futuristic environment, like living kind of seamlessly in the same, like Shinjuku or these places. It's like lit up more than Las Vegas. It's like literally... Um, What's that movie that was that was kind of based, like uh, Blade Runner was apparently Runner based on Tokyo, but kind of Ghost in the Shell, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, feels like that. But then you go down a little side street and like this old kimono shop that's been existed for three generations, and people are still smoking a, a like a traditional Japanese kiseru pipe and and just like hanging out and talking, and and this is kind of seamless. In, in Japan, it's effortless. And this is something I never ex experienced before. I thought it just blew me away. I thought I, I got to stay here for a while. And I ended up staying here <laughs> for a long time. Well, so the fantastic. first time I saw Rakugo was my, I was five years into my stay here. So I could speak some Japanese. And I was, I went to a yakitori shop, which I went, I went to this yakitori shop. You, I think most of your listeners probably know yakitori. It's, a, it's the chicken skewers, barbecue chicken skewers, tiny shop. Just like that was like my Japanese school. It's like talking to talking to the regulars. And um, I used to go there like eight times a week. <laughs> That's how much I loved Yakitori. And the owner of the shop had a little Rakugo show in his shop on the, in the tatami room, like once every couple of months. He'd get some uh, he'd get some professional story stars to come and, and do a show. And so he just invited me. And like the first, like it was love at first sight, literally. So the thing that I mean, and I read read about that in, in your background, right? That I mean, you started in theater, you understood the you know performance art. What is it that was specifically unique to Dakugo? The structure of it is really fascinating. I mean, for, well, first of all, yeah, lone storyteller kneeling on a cushion in a kimono, and 
just telling stories. It's, first of all, that was just incredible. The compactness of it all and just the use of people's imaginations to bring them into a world was amazing. But the structure of a, of a performance, like the first half is called the makura or the pillow part. And that's kind of an introduction to get the, to get the audience warmed up, but also for you to get to know the audience. But it's, it's almost exactly like stand-up comedy. It's a, it could be a form of stand-up comedy. There's not too much politics, not too much controversial re politics, religion, um, like racial stuff, not s swearing, sex. That kind of stuff is not really part of it. You really want, don't want to separate your audience. It's very, very light kind of family-oriented entertainment. But there are some stand-up comedians who are like that too. So it's, it, could, it could be stand-up comedy, basically. But then you bring your theme slowly into the story you're going to tell. In the second half, I turn my head to the left, I play one character. Turn my head to the right, I play another character. And everything happens through conversation. There's very, very little narration. All, everything happens through conversation. Like you, you glean the situation through, through the conversation of these characters. And these stories have been passed down from master to apprentice, master to apprentice, through the ages, like as old as 400 years. So like when Shakespeare was alive, Rakugo existed, which kind of blows me away. So just this whole package was just really just, uh, my mind exploded. I, I like to, to ask a little bit about the, the whole apprenticeship thing. Yeah. Right, because I did read that you're only the second, I think foreigner, like non-Japanese national to be a named Rakugo, Rakugo ka, I guess, like the, you know, like, uh, tell us a little bit about that and what that means. Yeah, and the first one was 100 years ago. Um, yeah, I was, I, I was just lucky to stumble upon this, that uh, it's kind of, it was kind of uncharted territory for, for non-Japanese. Um, so in order to be a recognized Rakugo storyteller, Rakugo ka, Rakugo storyteller, uh, the basic thing is that you do an apprenticeship under a master. And the ma it's used three to four years, usually no days off. You go and clean his or her house every day, do the laundry, fold kimonos, do menial chores. Very much wax on, wax off. It's very much in that vein. That was my um, image, like Mr. Miyagi. Like, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's a, such a, that's a Hollywood movie, but that part of it is very accurate as to a Japanese apprenticeship, a normal Japanese apprenticeship, traditional apprenticeship. Not just for Rakugo, but for, for all the art forms. It's very much... You don't go to school, pay the teacher, and learn for an hour a week. It's very much like do stuff for them and then watch and learn. And they say, Gei o nusumu, which means steal the art form. So that the master is not spending that much time teaching you. It's just watch, learn, glean what you can, ask a question when it's appropriate, but try to try to be quiet and, and not stand out, basically. Well, I mean. Uh, it sounds tough. It's psychologically, it's like you are kind of indentured servitude for for a couple of years. But on the other hand, what you learn, like what you would not learn if you were only meeting this person for an hour or two a week, it's just like the the, the master goes on the telephone and starts talking to a journalist about Rakugo for like an hour, and you're privy to that, right? Or when the master does a performance, and then after the performance, you see how the master deals with their fans or customers or um or or patrons and that kind of thing. Um, just all across a lifestyle, my master is very, very uh, fashion conscious, like what I learned about fashion from my master. Um, it was just, it's an unparalleled experience. I wouldn't want to do it again, twice, <laughs> but once is good. Once is perfect. Right? Like I just, I would never replace that three years um, of my life. It was strict. It was very strict, but. So and that's, you do the apprenticeship. Sorry, but back to your question. You do the apprenticeship. You get a name from your master, which includes your master's family name and a given name that usually includes one kanji from your master's name as well. So my master was Katsura San Shi, and I'm Katsura San Shine. So that, that, that ties me to, to my master from anyone that looks at my name. Uh, and then 99% uh, of the Rako storytellers, but, uh, there's about 1,000 now in, um, in Japan. 99% of them belong to one of the four or five Rakugo associations. So there's the Osaka Rakugo Association, and then there's two Tokyo Rakugo Associations, and then there's a couple that are, are specific to a storytelling group, one group. Uh, so there's a Tatekawa, um, Tatekawa Ryu, you say Tatekawa family, that has its own association, and the uh, San Yute uh, en, Enraku family, that has its own 
association. They broke off from the associations, formed their own associations. So you're usually one of those five. There's very few uh, Rakoka who are not part of it. So that's what it is to become a, a recognized uh, professional Rakoka, Rakoka storyteller. And I hadn't known until I was looking into your background. I mean, I, and I have to say here, the honorary consul for Japan, North Carolina, David Robinson is, is the guy, uh, I think probably a year or so ago, year and a half or so ago that he came to me and he said, Jonathan, I was just up at the, at the, the, Jap the Japanese embassy in DC. And at that time we had ambassador uh, Shinsuke J. Sugiyama. And you were his favorite Rakugo, uh, you know, uh, performer storyteller. And yeah. he said, we have to get him to North Carolina because he is fantastic. And well, I, hadn't, so I hadn't known then, I, I looked into your, you know, the, your, you know, your website and everything, that your master is such a, a very, 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 very famous, uh, like Katsura Bunshi, right? That, yeah, and, he's huge. I mean, he's really huge. And I had no idea that he was a tradition, also a traditional, very renowned uh, Rakugo storyteller. And I, yeah. I was just talking to you before the interview started about, I used to watch old reruns of, um, what was it, the, uh, the Shinkon-san Yirashai, like the, the, uh, the, the variety show that, that, that was going on for, for a long time. And how did you connect with him? That show is still on, if you can believe it. That's been on for like 50 years. Yes. He, <laughs> about 10 years ago, that show got into the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest running show with the same host. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, but yeah, yeah, he's very, very famous for that show. The Newlyweds Welcome is his is his uh, is his usual joke, right? Shinkonsan san irashai. That's what he always does. It's yeah? right. And it's then he tough. interviews newlyweds. That's all he does: interview newlyweds about their dating, uh, how they met, how they dated, and how they they uh, became married. And if they say something in the least bit scandalous, which we're talking like scandalous from fifty years ago, okay? So like we're not talking about too scandalous. They say something in the least bit. What do you call it? Um, uh, risque, risque. Shall we say? Yeah. There you go. His, Jinx, he risque. falls out of his chair. That's and he's been like people wait for half an hour every Sunday to see at what point he's going to fall out of his chair. Like that's the that's the basis of the show. Uh, but it's hilarious. His timing is incredible. But yeah, so a lot of people because he's on TV, he don't realize that he's his main job is Rakugo storytelling. He's written three hundred plus original Rakugo stories. So he's writing the traditional Rakugo stories of the future. It's amazing. He's an amazing, amazing person. Yeah. I and I should have been cued off to i mean it's it's the physical comedy part right the, the the physical part of it it should have cued me to a more traditional background in comedy i mean anyone who has lived and lived or, or visited japan if they're looking on television they're going to see a lot of the comedy in japan in, in my opinion is a lot of it is physical I mean, like manzai you know like if, if you if you get very physical i agree yeah Right. I mean, there's it's it's almost like watching like a Sid Caesar show of shows almost. It's like there's a yep, lot yep, of yep, that. Yep, yep. And so I, that should have cued me that, yeah. that he has a more traditional, you know, uh, a background that way. But how well, we don't fall off our cushions. So you, you, you might have been you might have been phased by that part of it. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably <laughs> falling under the chair. <laughs> but how did you connect with him? I did. It's a very, very traditional way. First of all, someone recommended me to go see him when because someone who knew that I wanted to become a Rakugo storyteller, and it was a it was a Rakoka. She herself was a Rakoka, and she said I would recommend going to see him because he creates his own stories, and he's looking. He's and he was president of the Rakugo Association at the time of Osaka, uh, but he also is always looking for th new ways to. Um, to bring bring new and added life to Rakugo, and particularly like if I was someone that was going to be eventually translating it into English and taking it abroad and that kind of thing, he would be someone that would be very much interested in 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 having an apprentice like that. Because traditional world, there's no non Japanese, so you 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 have to be careful of who you uh, ask to be your your master, right? So. So I went to see his show, but it, it just blew me away. He did three stories. The guy must have talked for two and a half hours himself. Plus, he, there were other guests, so it was incredible. Um, it was hilarious. It was his original stories, which I thought, you know, 
I could translate these into English right now and say them like next week in Canada and people will be on the floor. This stuff is hilarious and just very universal humor. So I love that. But even though he had talked, and he's not a young man, you know, at that time even, uh, he, he had talked for two and a half hours and he spent another hour outside with his fans taking pictures and stuff like that and signing autographs. And stuff. So just the love that people had for him, the affection that pe 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 people held for him and and the way he just gave back, because he's so famous, he doesn't need to do that anymore, but he still does. He really appreciates what brought him to where he is and, and he appreciates the people that have supported him through all these years. It's just uh, made me feel, fall in love with his art and also fall in love with him as a human being, yeah. The part of this that floors me, I mean, there's a lot of this that floors me, but the fact that comedy is such a very... I guess it has a duality. It's delicate and it's also robust. It's delicate in the fact that people's sensibilities, depending yeah. upon their background, their upbringing, can affect what they find funny. Yeah. But it's robust that when you find, in my opinion, wonderful comedy is, like you said, accessible. And yeah. translating this kind of traditional storytelling-based comedy from Japan into English for, I mean, you've been on Broadway. I mean, you, you've been in so many different places, you know, both in North American continent, Europe, you know, I mean, and Japan, I mean, everywhere. Do you ever find that you have to tailor your material to the demographic or do you just decide this is what I do? Um, that's a great question. And I frequently ask questions, but a very, very good question. There is you'd be very surprised there's absolutely no need to tailor anything about rakugo to anyone and it's not my decision being stubborn like here it is it's what people want um i started out by tailoring it a bit and people didn't like it very much but when i when i when i realized that i just got to trust the material and once i just did a straight translation and i speak english as if i'm speaking japanese same pauses same rhythm same osaka kind of machine gun talk is what they say right in japanese machine gun talk to your point because you know as a canadian when i was living in london for a couple of years i would understand maybe only two thirds of what was funny about a, a stand up comedian performing in london but that wasn't a language problem it was a culture problem it could not even culture not even culture just like i didn't grow up with them so i didn't i don't i didn't know the references that's all so once the once the joke was explained to me, ah, he was he's sort of making fun of this TV show we had on when we were young, and all the kids would have seen it. like and those London comedians when they come to states or Canada or something like that, they just they like weed out that stuff that Americans and Canadians aren't going to understand. And they do the stuff that's more universal, and they have plenty of material. That's that. But there, but that's what humor is for you. It's like okay, same same language, and when it's explained to me, it's funny. But if I didn't know it, I wouldn't pick up on it, right? So here we have this traditional art form from Japan translated into English, and it's 99% completely accessible. I think it's kind of a miracle. But I think, I think one of the reasons for it is that the, the Edo period is very different, was very different, very different culture than Japan now. It's 400 years apart, right? Like, it's, it's just a different world. And yet these stories have survived. So I think because they've survived the generations, survived the ages, survived the changing culture of Japan that they really speak to something very basic and human in all of us and just basic human relationships. And so that's why, because they're, they've been built that way, because that's in their DNA, you could translate them. And I could tell the story in New York on Broadway and in West End in London. I've been to four countries in Africa. Uh, I've performed them in French as well. I'm starting to learn them to perform them in Chinese and Italian. And people laugh at the exact same place in the exact same way that they do when I'm doing it for Japanese people in Japanese in Japan. So it's kind of a miraculous art form in that way. It's very rare to have a humorous, like where you depend on people's laughter, an art form like that to be so almost impeccably, perfectly translatable. I mean, no kidding. I, you know, I, I'm sure you probably know the uh, Eddie Izzard, who's yeah. uh, really, I mean. Love him. I love it. And, you know, because that, that what triggered that was the multiple languages, right? I mean, he's, he's, he's done his comedy in French. I think he's done it in German now. And he actually does bits now about how difficult it is to, to, to uh, take some of the material and make it translatable in his stuff to different cultures. Yeah. So, 
Why yeah, not? I mean that's such he's such because that like a lot of that humor could is is quite ironic of his, right? And like that that irony to like put that into French. Like you gotta you got you must have some really good help. Now, I think once you do, that's a good thing about comedy. Like once he if he gets his hour in French and he has to weed out what can he can't translate and find a way to do what he can. Once he has his hour, he's golden. I mean, he can just keep doing that and doing that, right? And then little by little add to it, and maybe then he has another hour. So, but it is very much starting again from scratch, even though you're using that material. So there is that part of it, yeah. And I, some of the stuff that I've seen, I've, I've never had the opportunity to be able to come and see one of your performances live, and I'm going to. Is Soon. we're going to be back on Broadway in October. Oh my, okay. All right. Cause when I saw that you were in, you're calling him from Tokyo, I was like, oh, is, is he like going to base his operations out of Tokyo? But I'm, I'm very happy that, that we're going to be welcoming you back. No. So here's the thing I was on Broadway at the New World, beautiful New World Stages Theater Complex for six months until COVID closed all the theaters down. All, all my stuff is still in the dressing room. They're very generous at the theater. They said, we're not going to be using the theater for much anyway. Keep your stuff here if we need it taken away we'll, get, we'll let you know but they didn't it was just closed right but they said as soon as we reopen please come back so i'm very fortunate uh we just haven't we haven't set an opening date yet because i'm sharing my theater space i'm sharing with one other uh show so we have to coordinate but basically uh october i hope to be there for for years i and um i'm there through the six months like audiences were getting bigger and bigger and it was getting a smaller percent of Japanese people and a bigger percentage of just New Yorkers and, and people from all over the States and that kind of thing. So it was starting to be treated like, uh, like just another show as opposed to like a, a Japanese cultural something. It was like, Oh, this, this show's funny. Let's go see it. Like the New York times seemed to like it. So let's go that kind of thing. Little by little we're reaching that. And I think after a year or two, like maybe it could become kind of like, okay, we'll go see Hamilton and then let's see something like a little smaller. Okay. Let's go to Rakugo. Like hopefully it'll, it'll, be, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be, I'd love to reach that level if possible. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I'm sure it's going to, because I mean, I'd love to reach the that, level of just a normal show. Like, I don't know why I'm <laughs> well, big dreams. I just want to be normal. <laughs> and, but I, this is the thing that I really like. So I've, I've been able to see you know, the, the clips that you host, you know, on, on your site and then on YouTube and the ones that, that you've put together and kind of taken out of your, your performances. Yeah. There are two things that I, that I've seen. I've seen the, the, the timeless stories that you have, you know, you got from your master who got from his master and so on. like the, the, um, the, the drinker and the gambler, right? Like the, that, that yeah. story about, which is, you know, which is by the way, YouTube, I'll put the link in underneath here about that. Like that it is, that is a great story, right? The, so that's one that's thing pretty, I'm seeing. Pretty funny. It really funny. I really liked it. And the other thing was that there is a bit of, of things that you talk about how is very unique to learning the specific Japanese for Rakugo, which is quite different than just like regular Japanese that we use. I mean, it's it's a little bit yeah. older, I guess, and and very polite language you have to use and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so I'll give you one example. Like when we start the show, you start with a greeting to the audience, and I'll do it in Japanese and I'll do it in English. In Japanese, it goes "Mina sama gorai jo itadaki arigato gozaimasu atsuku undei o moshiagimas watashi ko miete mo rako kan nan desu katsura san shi arata no rokudai katsura bunshi no jugo ban men doreshi no katsura san ni kagaku to kagimashite katsura san shine de gozaimasu doso yoroshiku mushiro goben tatsu no hodo onegai moshiagimas." And now in English, it goes like this: uh, "Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming." So sometimes English is shorter is basically what I'm trying to say. Yeah. The, but the thing that, that you put in to these, to, to these stories is like when you're talking about 47 different ways to say thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was another bit that, that you did that was, I, I was laughing so hard. My wife came into the room. She's like, what is wrong with you? What's you know, was, <laughs> was the, that there was something about that you had said that it was, I mean, the, that I had never heard before. It must have been in that Jisho, that dictionary that your your uh, master gave you about yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. whip me or something. It was that's no, that's Yoroshiku. You know, oh, Yoroshiku, that was Yoroshiku. Right? Sorry, you can't translate Yoroshiku. <laughs> it was, yeah, it's really hard. It's it means it means something like uh, I would like to express my gratitude now for your future kindness to me. 
is what's packed into the word there. But it's basically you use it when you meet someone for the first time or we start a day of work together for the first time or uh, not for the first time, but in the morning every day. Or like, yeah, you use it all the time in Japanese. It's actually like nobody even thinks of the meaning. It's just a, something to, it's a, it's a word just to like foster good relations and communication basically. But the most polite one is which kind of means please teach me and hit me with a whip. I just, I mean, like the, the goshido part, and we say like, you know, goshido kurasai, like please guide me or whatever. Like you do that when you come into a new job, but the rest of it, I was yeah, like, yeah. and I showed it to my wife and she was like, that, okay, that, that's really funny because that's, <laughs> is that's your wife that's, Japanese? Yeah, she's a Japanese national. Oh, so okay, she, so she, well, and because so, Japanese people, as I said, they were not, they're, even when they say goshido go bentatsu yeah. when, in a very formal occasion, they're not, you're not, uh, just like you and I are not thinking of the Latin roots of every word we speak, right? No. No, it's the same thing. It's like okay, well, in in, in older Japanese, this this kanji meant this, but they're not thinking of it at the time. But when you when you uncover it, it's just pretty funny. So so Japanese like, people actually really like that routine as well. That's kind of that's kind of why it's uh it can it, you can kind of you, you can play it both ways. Like for Japanese people, uh, when I when I do that routine, when I say that when I tell that story in in Japanese in Japan, Japanese people are like oh, that's pretty funny. Like we never th we never think of that. Just like a Japanese person came to us and said, do you know the Latin root of this is actually this? Isn't that funny? We'd be like, geez, never even thought of that. That's amazing, right? It's that kind of reaction. But when I do it in on Broadway for Americans, they're like getting a little a sneak peek into Japanese culture. So it works. It kind of works both ways. And this is, so I teach a business protocol workshop, right? Yeah. And because I worked in a very large traditional Japanese company. What you said about the longer it gets, the more polite it is. Yeah, right? yeah. The, is totally totally true yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, and i think that half japanese people that i've met in business situations that when you're do, going through those motions they they tune out halfway through it because they, they well you know what you know what you know what's it's gonna going. happen yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly right it's but, a, it, um, it gives your mind to rest you know the japanese is full of these set phrases but you know what it is when we meet anyone's like this we meet for the first time you're kind of shy. You don't want to offend the other person. You don't want to say something wrong. You don't want to do this. It's hard to like know what to say. You get a bit nervous. You get hard to know what to say at the beginning in any human relationship, right? Now in Japan, you've got the oh, you're going to ask me to more ah zehi zehi ah more de mo ano always or she naka. You there's so many things you can say that are completely meaningless, but that kind of just like you could just sort of inch toward content. But you don't have to suffer any kind of uncomfortable silence. It's so well put together culturally and linguistically and all that that I think it's it's brilliant. And you know, there are things in every language. We we go through these things, you know, and, and uh, in through English, Japanese, every other language are things that, like you said, we don't think about. Yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. These 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 parts of your performance, I think, are brilliant. That they're just uh, so well so well done. That I'm just like. Okay, I get that. You know, and but it's accessible. I lived and worked in Japan, but it's accessible for people who haven't. You know that it's that window, like you said. The other part that I oh, really yeah. find interesting is the utility of your props. Oh yeah, the uh, where's my uh, where's my fan and hand towel? Here's my hand towel, yeah. and here's my fan. So is that just like regular sensu? Like I mean, it's just like a regular fold out fan. It's um. There are a couple ones which we will use, so it's not you just don't you don't get you'll go you don't go get any fan. Like this will be different. This will be different from someone who is maybe doing nihon buyo, which is dancing. It'll be a little bit bigger than this. Also, this this particular fan is only used in Osaka. It's not used in Tokyo, Rakugo. There'll be a different one used in Tokyo. Um, so there's some things, but usually like a white fan. You say hakusen. You know, white fan doesn't have it any or too many markings on it. And then it's a hand towel. And this could be like chopsticks. Uh, this could be a pen and paper. This could be a, uh, a tobacco pouch. And then this would be the kisera pipe and you put it in and then you put it to the hibachi and light it and that kind of thing. Um, now, why, are the, why were these chosen as the props? Here's the thing. Uh, why, why do we wear a kimono when we perform Rakugo? It's because everyone wore a kimono in the Edo period. Why do we kneel on a cushion? It's because when you sat down on a, in a tatami room, you kneel on a cushion. It's basically, Rakugo storytelling is like, it's all, it's like stand-up com comedians today don't wear fancy outfits. They wear a t-shirt and jeans ordinarily, right? Some, some don't, but 
basically it's just like it, everything's coming from here. You don't even want to distract from your act with the clothing. Right. So it was just a very, it's very like I'm wearing my normal clothes and now I'm going to tell you a story. That's the attitude now because clothes have changed and Rakugo ha hasn't in that respect. We're still wearing kimono. So it's not, it's not necessarily everyday clothing anymore, but in the Edo period, if a man left in his kimono, if he left a house, he would always have a fan and a hand towel on him, especially in the summer like this to, to cool yourself and to, to wipe yourself back. That's a, these are these are the two things you'd have on you. So in a, in a, in a big way, like if, if Rakugo was started today, you'd have jeans, a T-shirt, and you'd have like an iPhone in your wallet would be the props or whatever. I don't know how you'd turn your iPhone into chopsticks, but that's another story. So basically, the, these were just really normal things to have on you, so they became the props for, for Rakugo. Thank you, because I didn't know. I don't think any, I mean, and the, the way that Nakago storytellers can use these props, I mean, the ones that you, you mentioned are, I think, you know, the ones that you, you'll see a lot, you know, like the, the, you know, the pipe. And, you know, but I've seen the fan to be a, uh, like a, a, a way, like a, to drink sake or something. Yeah, I did that recently. I drank, drank sake from a plate at a tea ceremony. I haven't done it very often, but I, I have seen that in Rakugo. So they'll, 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 like, ah, and then, yeah, you know, I don't do this in my stories. I just, I, I usually do a, uh, more of a cup, but, like but that's also, yeah, that's also one that comes out. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the other one I saw was someone was doing, I think they were talking about like chambada or something like, like sword, like swashbuckling. And oh, yeah, they used, like, yeah, oh, yeah. And they oh, used oh, it oh, as a sword. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. The other thing is though, we're not, we're not using this, these props like from beginning to end. It's just more of an accent. Sometimes you'll use the prop and it comes up and, and it's just, it, add, it adds to it. It's kind of an accent. So it's, I don't want to give people the impression that like you got to, like the, these, these things are being used constantly because that would be distracting to the audience. One of the things I love about Rocco is when you're knocking on the door, you go like this. Hello, anybody home? Hello. There's no effort to hide the fact that you're knocking your fan on the, on the floor in order to make the sound of, and nobody, nobody sees this. They don't like, they only see this. It's they're in the world. So, so I like uh, in Japanese, you say muda ga nai. There's no wasted effort. No need. It, it would be more distracting if I, if I were hiding this. Right. I so I really love that about Rakugo. It's just all, everything's, everything's like as, as, as it is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. And th that is a really, really good point. Um, so as I said, I mean, you've, you've traveled everywhere and, and you continue to do so and perform, uh, what keeps you engaged in this particular art form? You know? Oh, my God. you know, it's, if I have like a handful of people in front of me who are laughing their heads off at the story I'm telling, I don't, you don't have to pay me. It's just, it's just, it's just heaven. I love but do, it. But do, but do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got to eat. So, you know, I got to right. make money somehow. So of course, but, um. Actually, one of my seniors said, you know, performing is not working. And this was very, very interesting. He said, performing is not working. Performing is fun. Everything you do to prepare, right? You, uh, all the rehearsal, all the training, um, then all the putting yourself out there to get work, uh, getting like people to invite you, all the kind, uh, the kind of, um, uh, what do you call it? Like networking, all the other stuff that gives you opportunity to perform, that's work. When you're on stage, that is not work in the least. And I think that's, it's 100% right. When I was performing uh, on Broadway, I'm co-producer. I, I was raising money on my own. I'd be going, I'd be flying back between shows, like my shows Thursday and Saturday. On Sunday, I'd fly, get to Japan on Monday, have, have meetings with investors Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, fly Thursday morning, arrive in New York Thursday morning and be performing that night. I'd be doing that twice a month just to keep the whole, because a Broadway show is, it takes a while for it to break even. So at first, first, first year or so, you're like, you just got to keep, keep getting investment, keep getting sponsorship, all that. Literally, the two hours twice a week that I was on stage was my only respite. It's like, oh, finally I can relax. It was my only so stress-free time. Yeah, but it's, it's just wonderful. No matter how many people, sometimes the theater was packed, sometimes only like 30 people came to the show, but 
you know, those 30 people, they can be a great audience. It doesn't really matter once you're into the story and once they're loving it, everything, everything, everything disappears. I don't care if I've had no sleep. I don't care if I'm jet lagged. I don't care if I'm hungover. When I'm performing, it's just, I'm in another world and it's, yeah, it's me and the, it's me and the audience and it's a lot of fun. Oh man, that is so cool. It's magical in a way. Like why, how can I, how can I, how can I do this so stress-free when there's like so clearly a lot of stress in my life? It doesn't well, really it's, matter. It's, it's so clear that you have a passion and it's, it's from where, how you just uh, described it. That's your reward. Yeah. Is, it's a passion or it's a, like, uh, maybe it's a sickness. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a very heavy Magic. addiction. <laughs> but you know I, I was um I, I i watch a lot of like joe rogan when he's talking to comedians and like that like my favorite comedians are bill burr and um like dave Chappelle. when dave Chappelle talks about comedy like what those guys talk about it or and, and joe rogan says the same thing it's like it is literally an addiction like just to say something and have people laugh and to have the room like when they talk about that it's the same thing it's like, if I can get everybody imagining this story that I'm telling, like, there's just nothing better in life. I think Jerry Seinfeld in his interview says, like, once I get a laugh, that's, that, that, that's all I need is getting, is getting all, a laugh. You know? That's all you need, yeah. Oh, man, that's fantastic. It, the other thing that I thought was really cool, and I'm, I, I, I think it was you who, I, hopefully it was you who posted this on YouTube, talk, was that, that 47 ways to say, to say thank you in, in Japanese. Yeah, that's my, and, that's my, uh, that's my story. <laughs> that I mean like so but when, when I'm watching this and you you doing this there was a point where you were like can you believe that there are 47 ways of of saying thank you in Japanese and there and there wasn't as much of a reaction from the audience as you, as you had expected and in my opinion like nine out of ten comedians would have been would have been had been would have been like oh you know about that but then no lag nothing you were able to 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 bring them on board by saying usually when i when i say that say that story to an audience everyone goes ooh and stuff and you played with them with, for the next like minute and it was like you said magical because you got them in that minute they were they were in there yeah do you prepare for that or is it That's just great. hey you caught me really it's on purpose yeah so here's the thing. As a comedian, I was just talking about this in Japanese. Do you know Clubhouse? I'm doing a lot of Clubhouse now, and okay. um, it's the talking. It's the talking app where everybody's 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 just discussing stuff, right? It's okay. like Twitter, but it's it's like an audio Twitter where people get in rooms and they discuss stuff. So I was in this business business Japanese business people's room talking about like presentation skills and all that kind of thing. And they said, "Do you have any tips?" And I said, "They said sometimes I tell a joke at the beginning of a presentation doesn't go so well." I said, "One of the things we have as comedians." It's like, if it goes well, it goes well. If it does not go well, if a joke flops, you have these set things. In Japanese, you say hikidashi, which means drawers that you can pull out. Basically, you have these set things that you can do when a joke falls flat. And it's almost better that it fell flat because people laugh at that. I mean, Johnny Carson was a master at that. Like, just the way he lifted his eyebrows when a joke fell flat was just killed him every time. But he had that ready, right? Um... And so it's the same thing there. It's the same thing there. I noticed that sometimes you don't get a laugh there. Actually, it's not even, it's not even a huge laugh part, but I realized that, I realized that um, actually, I have to tell you, if you want to go into the background of, of, of performing in this way, this is, it's a kind of a long routine with not, with a lot of information. So the, the audience sometimes might get a bit tired with a lot of the information and there's payoff, but to get them to pay attention, I stop. And say, uh, ladies and gentlemen, usually when I say there's 47 different ways to say thank you, the audience responds with a very vocalized, ooh. The reason I came up with this is because one audience actually did say, ooh, it was pretty funny. It made me laugh on stage. Like, oh, didn't think you'd be that impressed, right? But then I thought, okay, that's kind of funny. Like, I can play with this. So then I say, can we do it again? And then I say, I say, there are 47 different ways to say thank you in Japanese. And everybody goes, whoa. It's okay. Now you guys are just making fun of me. And that usually gets a, a really good laugh. And then I continue. But the, per the, the real function of that little bit is to kind of wake people up. Because if I'm saying, hey, you guys aren't responding the way I expect you to, it kind of, it kind of jolts people into like paying attention again. And it's kind of fun. 
because they get to say ooh, and it's also it also gets a laugh. So it's actually it's a very functional little insert and has nothing to do with the reaction that I'm getting from the audience. Well, masterful. I've just I've just showed you how to do the magic trick now. I, I, but well, I mean, it's but it's when I saw it, I, I there was no didn't skip, didn't skip a beat, and yeah. So it's the, a, the, the fact that you just went through it again, and I've already seen it, and I laughed. Is there's something about it, even if you know it's coming? There's something about the way that you <laughs> perform it. You know, the yeah, people that see that sh people that see the show, and I, I know I'll bring that in like a lot. So, so people that see the show a few times, and, and they've heard it for the third time or fourth time. Nobody's ever complained. Like I've heard that ooh thing. I think the second time they hear it, it's like, oh, he planned it. That uh, son of a gun. Right? <laughs> I think there's a bit of that, but that's kind of fun in its own way. It's like, oh, okay, but also. It's kind of fun. And I remember being in the audience for, for moments like this. It's kind of fun. Okay, so how's today's audience going to react to this? That's kind of the fun of knowing the routine and being on the in, kind of being on the inside with me in a way that, um, you know, just repeating, like ha having people hear material more than once does not t take away from it in any way. Well, I, that's, that was so great. And I, I can't wait to see you live. I'm so happy that you're coming back. Yeah, I can't wait to be back. It's gonna be great. It's gonna be great to be back up on stage again. And I'm gonna have we're gonna have to somehow get you to North Carolina. I don't know. It's not North Broadway, North. but I we gotta get you here. It's no, no. It's the reason I'm on Broadway is so people invite me to their places. Fair enough. The reason I went to Broadway is so I could get to North Carolina. That's the order. <laughs> Thank you. If I wasn't on Broadway, you wouldn't want me to come. Like, who is this guy? Like, like, no, I was totally still like, okay, we gotta get him right here. <laughs> well, we will work on it. Yeah, we'll, absolutely. We'll, we'll I can't wait. That'll be wonderful. Yeah. yeah. We need more comedy. We need absolutely. more people need smiling. <laughs> I, I totally agree. That's, we need to end, you know, so um, I, I'm just so happy that I was able to, to get in your schedule and talk with you. And, and thank you so much for making time for me. And uh, can I do a mini rack ago about the pandemic? Go ahead. There are two, two, two Japanese ladies uh, talking about uh, all these issues in the news. And they were sitting behind me on, on, in the airplane. I overheard their conversation. It went like this. Did you hear? Did you know about this? Did you know that in Japan, in the Edo period, we used to take a candle and melt it on different parts of people's bodies and that that would have an effect that people would not get sick. It would have a preventative effect for different viruses and diseases. Really? In Japan, we used to do that with candles in order to prevent diseases? Japan is an amazing country, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. It was kind of a waxy nation. <laughs> now, everybody knows how sophisticated an art form Rakugo is. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much for that. That is, that is so great. I, you know, and um, so what I, what I would like to do then is, uh, you know, of course, on our website, I'd like to, you know, put in your website and, you know, the, maybe some of the, the YouTube clips that you put up there. And um, you did say that you're coming back, you know, back on Broadway. Are there yeah. any other future things um, that, that you'd like to, for people to know about? No, I'm coming. I'm coming to you guys. Okay. We just got to can't wait. Out. We yeah, I can't stuff. wait. But if uh, <laughs> if any of your watchers or listeners are in New York, like to, to, to let me know. I'd love to go for a drink after the show if you're able to come. Well, thank you so much, and you're so gracious yes. with your time and, and your art. Uh, Katsura Sunshine, thank you so much. Thank you much. so much. Cheers. Yeah. Arigatou gozaimashita. Bye-bye. Thank you.